We welcome now um, today Professor Greg Rickard. Greg is an ACM board member and current professor and director of, uh, at the University of Tasmania at the Roselle campus. Greg was previously the chief nurse and um, midwife for the Northern Territory. So without further ado, I'd like to very much welcome Greg to the podium. Thank you, uh, thank you Anne. I'd like to welcome um, and to this uh, my presentation, <laughs> uh, ACN members, staff and special guests. And uh, hello to our staff and uh, special guests in, uh, in Canberra. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the lands of which we gather today. In Parramatta, the Darug people, of the Eora Nation that encompasses the lands north to the Hawkesbury, west to the Nepean River, and south to the George's River, and to the Nugawal people, the traditional owners of the land where our staff and colleagues meet in Canberra. I wish to pay my respects to the elders of the Darug people and the Nugawal Nation, both past and present. I also wish to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nurses and midwives. In particular, Dr. Sally Gould, who was the inaugural CEO of Capsinum, the uh, Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nurses and now midwives. Dr. Louisa O'Donoghue, who was the Congress's first patron. Janine Mohammed, who was the current CEO of Capsinum and new and emerging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nurses and academics, in particular, Professor uh, Royanne West from Griffith University, and she is the first professor, um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, professor. Prof uh, professor Juanita Sherwood from the University of Sydney, Dr. Odette Best from QU uh, University, uh, Queensland uh, University of Technology, Mr. Ali Drummond at uh, James Cook University, a Tor uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, man, and my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Uh, sorry, Ted Murphy from the Northern Territory. The map I show you now is the First, Station, uh, First Nations map. It, it is all about knowledge, knowing the knowledge, knowing the language and knowing the land. What this map does for me is represent the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Australia. There is no one distinct group. There is no one distinct lead, leading group. And therefore the challenge for us Australians is to understand that diversity and how we're going to work with that diversity. This map has been created by research undertaken from 1988 to 1990, sorry, 1988 to 1994, uh, with some of the locations and traditional owners still being disputed. A lot of, lot of writing on this page, but really just to represent the, the fact that there is multiple um, things that have happened over the time since uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, inhabited or uh, lived on the Australian continent, going back around about 400, sorry, 40,000 years. In, in 1770, it was called terra nullis, meaning no people, nothing on the land. Highlighted there is the referendum in 1967, where 90.7% of the Australia, of Australians voted yes in the referendum to actually recognise and count Indigenous Australians in the census and to give the Commonwealth Government the power to make laws. Another highlighted in red is 1992, the High Court Mabo decision which overturns terra nullis and which rules that native title exists over alienated crown land, over na na uh, national parks and reserves. 
there's a lot more things that I could mention uh, of significance there. But today, our focus is on, close, on the Close the Gap campaign. There is a stain on Australia that past generations have failed to remove. It is the entrenched divide between non-Indigenous Australians and our First People, who continue to be denied the most basic human rights to health, equality and old age. The unacceptable health and life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is what led me to establish Close the Gap campaign 10 years ago. These are the words of Professor Tom Kalmer, founder of the Close the Gap campaign and, and Chancellor of the University of Canberra, patron and chair of the uh, Pinch, uh, Indigenous Health Network and also co-chair of Reconciliation Australia. The Close the Gap campaign is to raise the health and life expectancy of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people to that of the non-Indigenous population within a generation to close the gap by 2030. Its aims is through the implementation of a human rights based approach set out by the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Social Commissioner's Social Justice Report in 2005. And it was then a year later that Professor Tom Kalmer initiated the first committee of the Close the Gap. The, the Close the Gap patrons include uh, Cathy Freeman and Ian Thorpe, who launched the campaign in 2007. And it has become the largest and highest profile health event in this country with a focus on the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Last year, 2015, over 1,500 community events were held across Australia. And I looked at the data just um, this week, 289,190 Australians have formally pledged their support to close the gap. Now again, lots of small writing, but I just want to emphasise that the close the gap Indigenous Health Equity, uh, sorry, Equality uh, Summit Statement of Intent was signed in Canberra, March 20, 2008. One was to develop a comprehensive long-term uh, action plan, again, so that, uh, so that non, -in sorry, Indigenous people health would be the same as non-Indigenous by 2030 to ensure that primary healthcare services and health infrastructure were available to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by 2018. Ensuring full participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in all aspects of addressing their health needs. To working collaboratively to systematically address the social determinants of health impacting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. To build on the evidence base and support and supporting what works in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. To support and developing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community control health services. To achieving improved access to and outcome, outcomes from mainstream services. To respect and promote the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people ensuring that they have health services that are available, appropriate, accessible, affordable, and of good quality. And to measure, monitor, and report on our joint efforts. This statement of intent was signed by the following people. I'd just like to highlight that Dr. Sally Gould from Katzen signed the initial uh, statement of intent with along, along with the Prime Minister, and also with Tom Kalmer. Members of Close the Gap include the Australian College of Nursing. We have been one of the first members, uh, organisations to join Close the Gap, as was the Australian College of Midwives. And as you can see there, uh, Katzenham, uh, Krana Plus, which is the Congress, uh, sorry, the Council of Remote Area Nurses Australia, but now that includes Aboriginal health workers and other remote workforce, and also the Lewitcher 
Institute, named after Louisa O'Donoghue. So the 2015 Prime Minister and Cabinet report on Close the Gap targets indicated that most were not on track. Close the Gap life expectancy, not on track, limited progress. Half the gap in mortality rates of Indigenous children under five within a decade, on track. Ensure access for all Indigenous four-year-olds in remote communities to early childhood education, not met. Close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, Indigenous school attendance within five years. They've had to re-look at the baseline measurement for that. Half the gap in reading, writing and numeracy achieved for Indigenous students, not on, gap, not on track. Half the gap for Indigenous Australians aged 20 to 24 in Year 12, attainment or equivalent, on track. Half the gap in employment outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians by uh, 2018, not on gap. So we've got fifth, around about 15 years to go to meet the overall objective, to close the gap and reduce the health inequality by 2013. 30. In response to the Prime Minister and Cabinet's report 2015, the Steering Committee recommended staying on path, the role of culture, access to services as a measure of success, Build on the strength of the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services. Build an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce. Addressing mental health suicide prevention. To target a target to reduce imprisonment rates. Health in all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy approach and the implementation of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan. I put this slide up to just to reflect on both the outcomes achieved so far and also the statement made by statement in response to that made by the steering committee. We've had in 2014 the threatened closure of up to 100 Indigenous remote communities by the WA government. The 2014 federal budget cut $534 million from the Indigenous programs. There has been the closure of the Mount Druitt, Western Sydney Aboriginal Medical Service on the 14th of August 2015. There has been lack of funding for empowered communities from September 2015. There have been challenges to the Anti-Discrimination Act by mainstream media. We have experienced racism in sport. And only five days ago, a 10-year-old girl committed suicide in an Aboriginal community of Loma in West Kimberley. So where, uh, where is the equality, equity, and what is the reality? Equality ensures individuals or groups of indi or groups of individuals are treated fairly and equally, with no less favourable spe favourability specific to their needs, including the areas of race, gender, disability, religion or belief, sexual orientation or age. Promoting equality should remove discrimination in all of the aforementioned areas. So equality is the same standard applied to all, as indicated on the left-hand side. But what is equity? Equity is a quality judgment of being fair and impartial, but it is a judgment about what is fair and equal. It is about leadership and it's about doing the right thing. It's about being courageous and bold. On the right hand side, 
we have reality. And reality depends on what position you're in, what position is your history and your experience. So briefly on my reflections as the Northern Territory Principal Nursing and Midwifery Advisor for nearly eight years, I, I went to work every day and I had the privilege to work with Aboriginal nurses and midwives, although few in number, with Aboriginal health workers, Aboriginal mental health workers, administrative support staff and academics. About a third of the population in the Northern Territory are Aboriginal. That's 70,000 70, out of 200,000 people. But in hospital, the hospital population was over 80%. In the dialysis unit, I saw one white man. In Aboriginal remote communities, I experienced and worked with remote area nurses who, were the, who are the only health worker on the ground beside the Aboriginal, the local Aboriginal health workers. I saw a lot of great work being done, despite only the bad news, getting media attention. I worked in collaboration with the Northern Territory Government and Charles Darwin University in a cross-sectorial approach to develop education and employment pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I also was there when the federal government implemented the national emergency intervention after the Children Are Sacred report, where many people's lives were heavily regulated and many felt ashamed and angry. I also completed my doctorate in public health, examining Indigenous governance in healthcare and the impact of governments, both federal and territory, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health outcomes and well-being. Just like, um, we'll now just go to this uh, short video by Stan Grant. <coughs> this video was uh, uh, made in January 2016. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming along this evening and I would also like to extend my respects to my Gadigal brothers and sisters from my people, the Wiradjuri people. In the winter of 2015, Australia turned to face itself. It looked into its soul and it had to ask this question, who are we? What sort of country do we want to be? And this happened in a place that is most holy, most sacred to Australians. It happened in the sporting field. It happened on the football field. Suddenly, the front page was on the back page. It was in the grandstands. Thousands of voices rose to hound an indigenous man, a man who was told he was an Australian, a man who was told he was an Australian of the year. And they hounded that man into submission. I can't speak for what lay in the hearts of the people who booed Adam Goods, but I can tell you what we heard when we heard those boos. We heard a sound that was very familiar to us. We heard a howl. We heard a howl of humiliation that echoes across two centuries of dispossession, injustice, suffering and survival. We heard the howl of the Australian dream and it said to us again, you're not welcome. The Australian dream. We sing of it and we recite it in verse. Australians all let us rejoice for we are young and free. My people die young in this country. We die 10 years younger than average Australians and we are far from free. We are fewer than 3% of the Australian population and yet we are 25%, a quarter of those Australians, locked up in our prisons. And if you are a juvenile, it is worse. It is 50%. An Indigenous child is more likely to be locked up in prison than they are to finish high school. I love a sunburned country, a land of sweeping plains, of rugged mountain ranges. 
reminds me that my people were killed on those planes. We were shot on those planes. Disease ravaged us on those planes. I come from those planes. I come from a people west of the Blue Mountains, the Wiradjuri people, where in the 1820s, the soldiers and settlers waged a war of extermination against my people. Yes, a war of extermination. That was the language used at the time. Go to the Sydney Gazette and look it up and read about it. Martial law was declared and my people could be shot on sight. Those rugged mountain ranges, my people, women and children were herded over those ranges to their deaths. The Australian dream. The Australian dream is rooted in racism. It is the very foundation of the dream. It is there at the birth of the nation. It is there in terra nullius, an empty land, a land for the taking. 60,000 years of occupation a people who made the first seafaring journey in the history of mankind, a people of law, a people of law, L-O-R-E, a people of music and art and dance and politics, none of it mattered because our rights were extinguished because we were not here according to British law. And when British people looked at us, they saw something subhuman and if we were human at all, we occupied the lowest rung on civilization's ladder. We were fly-blown Stone Age savages, and that was the language that was used. Charles Dickens, the great writer of the age, when referring to the noble savage of which we were counted among, said it would be better that they be wiped off the face of the earth. Captain Arthur Phillip, a man of enlightenment, a man who was instructed to make peace with the so-called natives in a matter of years, was sending out raiding parties with the instruction, bring back the severed heads of the black troublemakers. They were smoothing the dying pillow. My people were rounded up and put on missions from where if you escaped, you were hunted down, you were roped and tied and dragged back. And it happened here, it happened on the mission that my grandmother and my great grandmother are from at Warren Gesda on the Dar Darling Point at the Murrumbidgee River. Read about it, it happened. By 1901, when we became a nation, when we federated the colonies, we were nowhere. We're not in the Constitution, save for race provisions, which allowed for laws to be made that would take our children, that would invade our privacy, that would tell us who we could marry and tell us where we could live, the Australian dream. By 1963, the year of my birth, the dispossession was continuing. Police came at gunpoint under cover of darkness to Mapoon, an Aboriginal community in Queensland, and they ordered people from their homes and they burned those homes to the ground and they gave the land to a bauxite mining company and today those people remember that as the night of the burning. In 1963, when I was born, I was counted among the flora and fauna, not among the citizens of this country. Now, you will hear things tonight. You will hear people say, but you've done well. Yes, I have. And I'm proud of it. And why have I done well? I've done well because of who has come before me. My father, who lost the tips of three fingers working in sawmills to put food on our table because he was denied an education. My grandfather, who served to fight, fight wars for this country when he was not yet a citizen and came back to a segregated land where he couldn't even share a drink with his digger mates in the pub because he was black. My great-grandfather, who was jailed for speaking his language to his grandson, my father, jailed for it. My grandfather on my mother's side, who married a white woman who reached out to Australia, lived on the fringes of town until the police came, put a gun to his head, bulldozed his tin humpy, and ran over the graves of the three children he buried there. That's the Australian dream. I have succeeded in spite of the Australian dream, not because of it, and I have succeeded because of those people. You might hear tonight, but you have white blood in you. And if the white blood in me was here tonight, my grandmother, she would tell you of how she was turned away from a hospital, giving birth to her first child because she was giving birth to the child of a black person. The Australian dream. We're better than this. I have seen the worst of the world as a reporter. I've, I spent a decade in war zones from Iraq to Afghanistan and Pakistan. We are an extraordinary country. We are, in so many respects, the envy of the world. If I was sitting here where my friends are tonight, I would be arguing passionately for this country. But I stand here with my ancestors, and the view looks very different from where I stand. 
the Australian dream. We have our heroes. Albert Namadira wrote that painted the soul of this nation. Vincent Lingiari put his hand out for Gough Whitlam to pour the sand of his country through his fingers and say, this is my country. Kathy Freeman lit the torch to the Olympic Games, but every time we are lured into the light, we are mugged by the darkness of this country's history. Of course racism is killing the Australian dream. It is self-evident that it's killing the Australian dream. But we are better than that. The people who stood up and supported Adam Goods and said no more, they are better than that. The people who marched across the bridge for reconciliation, they are better than that. The people who supported Kevin Rudd when he said sorry to the stolen generations, they are better than that. My children and their non-Indigenous friends are better than that. My wife who is non-Indigenous is better than that. And one day I want to stand here and be able to say as proudly and sing as loudly as anyone else in this room, Australians all, let us rejoice. Thank you. What incredibly emotional um, response I get from uh, Stan Grant's speech. It was just, just blew, has blown me away uh, and has inspired many, many tweets um, and some amazing responses from the Australian media and from the Australian population. I, uh, he says it so well. Close the gap. What will ACN do and be known for? What will ACN's leadership be in this space? We have to know who we are as nurse leaders, to act with integrity, to manage ourselves, to display resilience and courage and, and value diversity. And as I said before, to be courageous and bold, and in particular, know the difference between equality and equity. As nurse leaders, we need to develop our capabilities, to develop our skills, to develop our Indigenous knowledge, to develop our cultural safe behaviours. We need to collaborate and share this knowledge and our expertise to develop others, to communicate effectively, to work collaboratively, around acts of cultural safety and promote safe workplaces. And we need to practice this each and every day, our leadership, to deliver results, to plan and prioritise, to think and solve problems and to demonstrate accountability in this space to help close the gap. I've reflected on the oration, the ACN's oration by Professor Roy Ann West in, in Adelaide in 2004. It's 14, only two years ago, where Roy Ann asked ACN to rise to the challenge of our time delivering on better health outcomes for our nation's first people. Roy Ann focused on four key issues to address. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander structural disadvantage. She asked us to focus on the role of Indigenous knowledge for two-way learning. That's a whole area of topic that I could spend probably another couple of uh, thesis on looking at two-way knowledge. But it, it underpins the way that we, we need to work with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues, governments included. The role of leadership, rising to the challenge for better health for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island. The role of education and commitment, commitment to cultural safety. And the possibility of a first class health service and outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Roy Ann said, our profession, nursing, is and has been at the forefront of health advancement here in Australia and around the world. As nurses comprise over half the Australian health workforce, nurse leaders promise health services policy and academia 
need to collaborate to strategically build the cultural capability of the nursing workforce to this end. We need leaders who can unite and inspire us and continue to model the required behaviours for future nursing leaders. Royan also spoke of a health, uh, sorry, a strengths-based approach that makes significant contribution to humankind. One of the strengths-based approach has been put forward by empowered communities, promoting the five social norms of children going to school, adults working, paying rents for homes, community safety, and community drug and alcohol plans. The Empowered Communities is an initiative of eight Aboriginal communities around Australia they, that in 2014 took their plan to the federal government for funding. This is backed by people like Noel Pearson from Hopevale, from Mar Mar Marcia <coughs> Langton from the APY lands, Sean Gordon from Central Coast and in collaboration with Redfern and the La Perouse people. From the Kimberleys, from uh, North East Arnhem Land, and from a group uh, Shepparton in Victoria. They're still waiting on being notified by the federal government whether that funding will come through. I'd like to move to recognise it's time to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Australian Constitution and to ensure that there is no place for racial discrimination in it. It's the right thing to do. And for those who can see me, my T-shirt has, uh, has got the recognised symbol. And therefore, the federal government is planning or uh, tells us that in 2017, which will be the 50 year since the passing of the uh, 1967 referendum, that Aboriginal people are counted in our census and that their affairs are managed by the federal government, that the referendum will happen in 2017. I think we can only hope but hope's eternal. I'd like to thank the Australian College of Nursing for their invitation to contribute in some small way to National Close the Gap Day 2016. Thank you.